Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you by Book of Zen, inspirational apparel for a better world. To learn more, please visit bookofzen.com. Today's reading has been edited and adapted from Success Through Thought Habit by Benjamin Johnson, published in 1908. Have confidence in yourself. Believe in your ability to do big things. Only by having faith in yourself can you compel others to have faith in you. Think big thoughts and back them up with big deeds. You can if you will, and you will. Many a little seed has longed to develop and send a little shoot up toward the sunshine. But growth has always been delayed until suddenly the outer wall that limited its growth is burst apart. Many lives are in the same condition. The wall of thought that limits them must be burst before real growth can occur. The one great infallible rule to be learned when you desire to think constructively is that the conditions you desire will exist for you in just the proportion that you are capable of developing your own natural powers. If you persist in drawing a line of demarcation between yourself and that which you desire, or if you feel that a certain person is responsible for what you are to obtain, or that a certain condition dependent on other people is necessary for your development, then just so long will you be kept from making the progress that you should. Yes, indeed, I was full of enthusiasm when I started in the work. But one thing after another went wrong until I just thought I would stop trying and get out while I could. Shows that your backbone has never been developed at all. Otherwise every obstacle would have spurred you on to greater effort. Most of the disappointments in life come because we are not only limited in our ability, but also in our vision of what will bring to us the greatest happiness. To desire a definite thing is the way most people begin to prove their ability to obtain a goal. But often after this ability has been proved, the thing itself does not always prove what one anticipated, and disappointment results. Now, nothing was wrong with the rule or the wish, but the individual did not realize the wisdom of working for a condition rather than a specific object. For example, instead of feeling that to love and be loved by a certain person will make one happy, it is wiser to desire happiness and feel, even though the individual may disappoint one, happiness will come in its own way. To desire a condition and then become upset and discouraged because every plan is changed retards the progress of many until we learn that often what seems like a cruel disappointment is merely the opening of a better way to get results. A well-known physician on the Pacific coast once spoke of his own experience as an illustration of the necessity for keeping one's faith in the ultimate outcome, no matter how dark things may look. He had just purchased a beautiful home in a large East Coast city, established a lucrative practice, and received the appointment of professor of medicine at one of the best colleges. One day it occurred to him to try one of his own tests on himself and he subsequently found himself afflicted with tuberculosis. He described himself as being utterly crushed, both mentally and physically, for the first few days. But finally he rallied and became determined to win success in spite of poor health, loss of income, and the sacrifice of his home. 
In 10 years, he had a splendid practice, and his health was completely restored. In 15 years, he was independently wealthy, and to quote from his own words, Had I remained in what seemed to me initially such a desirable condition, I would have made a bare existence. As it was, when I recovered from the shock, I became determined to make good on my potential. Instead of the limited income of a college professor, I became determined to become a specialist capable of earning large sums of money. I seemed to make money the moment I entered the new town, and I spent it as readily as I made it. I felt my supply was unlimited, and so it has proved. The spirit that controls the universe is never limited. We are blessed with a profusion of everything, and yet we fail to take advantage of our blessings. With the sunshine pouring down, many people shiver and walk on the shady side of the street. With air laden with health-giving oxygen, many walk with their shoulders bent and obstinately refuse to breathe deeply enough to give their lungs enough of nature's remedy to purify and invigorate the blood that is pumped into them for this very purpose. Nature is always lavish. We alone impose limitations to health, wealth, harmony, and happiness. Hundreds, yes, thousands of people are every day ignorantly worshipping a god of limitations instead of a god of abundance. They are not really worshipping the god that does exist but the God they think exists, and they excuse their own failure to accomplish by explaining, if God really wanted me to have this or that or the other, he would give it to me. The farmer might as well say, if God wants me to have a good harvest, he will send the showers of the crops need, and just the right amount of sunshine, and he will stop the weeds from growing and when the time is ripe and the grain is ready, I will gather it in and send it to the market. Likewise, the merchant might say, I won't take that trip to look over new things. I am sure God will send me just the right articles and my patrons will be just as well satisfied. And so, one might go on down the line until in every department of life, we could well imagine everyone sitting down lazily and explaining, God will provide. And God does provide, but in proportion to the intelligence with which demands are made, the energy with which the work is prosecuted, and the ability to organize one's thoughts, habits, and efforts. Those who wish the God of limitations may be known by one very common trait. They are always going to do something, and they are always waiting for the proper time in which to begin their efforts. If they want to continue some type of study, they will wait until the time when there are no interruptions, and thus never commence that study. If they intend to pay a visit, they will wait until the time is just right for that trip, and oftentimes that particular trip is never taken. They admire and recognize ability in others, and often desire feebly to imitate them, but always their vision of their self-created God of limitations interposes, and they hear, It may all be very well for those others, but you know, I have not the strength, not the ability to attempt anything of that kind. So back they sink again, not realizing they lacked will rather than ability. Ask people of this type if they enjoyed a movie or a book or an outing, and the answer will be, oh yes, it was very nice, but... And that but speaks volumes. 
This limitation thought extends to all their acquaintances, and naturally their children are fairly steeped in it. Even the neighbors are limited and they grow to think of poor Mrs. Jenkins' bad heart and Mr. Brown's bum leg. Try to mention a constructive thought and that too is used the other way about. For instance, instead of saying, I am happy, I will be happy, the person with a limited vision declares, I will not be depressed. The one is affirmation, the other negation. Likewise, children are requested not to be bad, instead of reminding them that it is easy to be good. They are told not to be late for school instead of suggesting that they be on time. They are warned not to get their feet wet, instead of requested to keep their feet dry. All small matters, yes, but they show the trend of thought. Right now someone is probably asking, what is the difference anyways? The difference is this. By telling someone to do the right thing the right way, you prevent the thought of doing anything the wrong way from entering the mind. Always suggest what you desire accomplished, not what you wish avoided. Always affirm what you desire to accomplish. Never explain why it is impossible for you of all people to accomplish it. Don't you believe in any limitation, I am asked? And I answer by a quotation. Impossible. There is no such word. No one can see the other side of the ocean, yet every day tens of thousands embark, filled with the faith that they shall reach the other side safely. And they do. The beginning of the history of civilization in our own country, as we learned it in school, is one of the best illustrations we have as to the futility of limitations. Poverty, contempt, ridicule, all were tried on Columbus without avail. He persevered until finally the queen herself pawned her jewels to aid him. Yet Columbus had never seen America nor had the queen any definite ideas on the subject. And then, when he did depart, it was in a vessel that no sane man would embark on today. But Columbus didn't dream of a limit. What he was longing for was a new country, and he found it. And so, we who would succeed and progress each day must learn that the only limitation we have in life is the one we acknowledge ourselves. The opinion of others cannot hinder our growth unless we acknowledge its power. The room that is wired with electricity remains unlighted until the switch is turned on, and even then the amount of illumination depends upon the number and size of the lamps. The very same wire conveys enough current for all the light we need, it is the way we use it that really counts. Within every life is the vital current that acts upon the individual exactly the same as the electric light does to the home. With this exception, there may be trouble along the line that will cut off the supply to the electric light. But with the individual, Nothing can cut off or diminish our supply of light but ourselves. The amount that we get being always determined by our desires and our ability to use it wisely. The I am and the I know I can individual has learned the first lesson in the use of this current. Finally, we succeed in life by recognizing our oneness with the universal supply and working firmly toward our goal without regard to the apparent obstacles or fear of the future. We are daily building up a consciousness that is crowding out every vestige of limitation 
and thus making it possible for us to work toward the success we desire. You will never find time for anything. If you want time, you must make it here and now. Human limitations to progress must be resolutely swept aside before the first step toward development can be made. As one writer has so aptly said, the individual who insists on being carried soon forgets how to walk and naturally loses the ability to use their own limbs. So in the use of the mind, the only success you can obtain is the one you can visualize. The only hindrances to that success are the limitations you recognize. To limit yourself, your friends, and your household by the thought of weakness, ill health, lack of training, lack of knowledge, or any other reason that may be expressed is merely building the wall of limitation higher every moment. To banish the feeling of limitation, it is necessary to make the positive affirmation, I can accomplish, without explaining anything stands in your path. You have made your own limitations, and you may destroy them if you will but use your willpower for that purpose. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts, please go to livinghour.org. If you would like to support our podcast and the work we do, you can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month. To become a patron, please go to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. And do a quick search for The Inspirational Living Podcast. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. Share the gift of inspiration this holiday season with our new hardcover book, Evergreen, 50 Inspirational Life Lessons. Learn more at inspirationallifelessons.com. Today's podcast has been edited and adapted from The Aim of Life by Philip Stafford Moxham, published in 1894. Life is a mission. Every other definition of life is false and leads all who accept it astray. Religion, science, philosophy, though still at variance upon many points, all agree on this, that every existence is an aim. It is the high distinction of humanity that we are capable of living with an aim that is, with a purpose which, reaching through all our lives, unifies it and gives it directness and force. An aim in life would be impossible if we were not a rational, free personality, having duty and a destiny. There is, then, a singular abdication of real dignity if you live your life without a purpose and there is no more serious and important matter for you to consider than your life's aim. It is important because it intimately concerns success, and still more because it concerns the formation and development of character. I wish you to think of this whole subject with a new seriousness and force. Life is tremendous in its possibilities, more than half the battle for true success is won in beginning right. I do not ask now what's your aim in life. That question we shall mutually consider a little later. 
Let us first think about the general question. The aim of life includes both an object or end toward which life moves and a purpose which impels it to that end. By this phrase I mean the supreme object and the ruling purpose of your life. Although we may have many minor and subordinate aims, we can have but one supreme aim, and from this supreme aim all the others take their real character. Our aim in life is that object or end which draws to itself our highest thought and aspiration and endeavor, and it is that purpose which, consciously or unconsciously, makes the strong mid-current in the stream of our activity that ever moves onward, however many may be the eddies and transient back-currents that perplex the stream's margin. The aim of life is that which creates life's tendency and supremely determines conduct. The real aim of life, let me remind you, is not always the apparent aim, for we are often self-deceived as to the chief ends, and often others are deceived by them. But conduct, in the long run, must be consistent with our ruling purpose, for it is this which qualifies and directs conduct. What you are supremely living for determines the course you are taking year in and year out. For example, there are two main directions which your life may pursue. One is toward good, the other is toward harm. A stone thrown from the hand goes up or down. It never keeps a horizontal line. Gravitation pulls it toward the earth. The moment it leaves the hand, gravitation begins to overcome the upward propulsion, and at last is completely victorious. The track of the stone is a curve, the farther end of which rests on the ground. In the realm of the moral life, there are only two tendencies and directions, upward and downward, the gravitation toward harm and the attraction or propulsion toward good. You can find in the universe no neutral course for a moral being. There may be confusing oscillations in a life's tendency. It may at some point describe a crooked and uncertain path. But as a whole, it has a definite trend this way or that. The definite trend of your life discovers your real aim. You cannot disguise it except transiently. It is not something outside of you compelling you this way or that. It is you, the complex of your generic choices and volitions. I dwell on this because it is one of those trite yet tremendous truths which so many forget or ignore, and which has such vital consequences in the destiny of the soul. Always you are moving somewhere, always you are becoming somewhat, and the direction which you are now taking the character which you are now forming, the success or failure of your life, is unchangeably determined. The most critical moment in your experience is when you consciously and deliberately ask, where am I going? What am I becoming in thought and feeling and character? Then, if ever, is the choice made, the purpose formed, which henceforth makes your life story easy to read. When we step upon the threshold of adulthood, we often ask questions such as, how can I best earn a living? What trade or profession shall I learn? What business shall I follow? How can I get an education? How can I make a fortune? But deeper than all these is the one question that gives meaning to all the rest. What am I living for? What shall be the supreme purpose and result of my life? The thoughts that I wish to present to you now gather themselves naturally about two simple propositions. 
The first of these is, everyone ought consciously to have an aim in life. Whether we are conscious of it or not, everyone has a ruling tendency, but everyone should also have a controlling and persistent purpose in life. No one has a right to live aimlessly, for no one has a right to abandon reason and self-control and consent to be a mere waif drifting like a plaything of the winds. We are endowed with powers that make us capable of good and often great achievement. We are gifted with reason and conscience and will in order that we may both become and do that which is noble and beneficent. In the mythology of the Greeks, Phaethon aspired to drive the flaming chariot of the sun. The task was beyond his human powers, and his disastrous rashness resulted in his death by a bolt hurled from the hand of Zeus. But the Naiades who buried him wrote in his epitaph, he could not rule his father's car of fire, yet it was much so nobly to aspire. The individual who drifts aimlessly through the years from youth to age does not truly live. Indeed, those whose aim is even lower than the highest, less than the greatest, is nobler than those who have no conscious purpose in life. But besides being ignoble, a purposeless life is inefficient. To aim at nothing is to hit nothing. The cannonball strikes somewhere, though the cannon be fired at random. So each of us is moving towards some end. Each soul should be not a missile aimlessly flung upon destiny by external forces, not the ball that flies wildly toward a unperceived mark, but the archer that aims with conscious purpose and inherent propulsive force onward to a definite goal. Many a person falls short of that at which they aimed, and some people attain more or other than the specific object which they sought. But no one who has lived with a purpose has failed of a certain efficiency. The dreary and desert hell of utter failure is reserved for the soul that has not lived, who has existed without a name. Of first importance, then, in the consideration of the question as to what your life shall be, is the fact that you cannot avoid moving towards some end, good or bad, that it is your duty to move consciously in the line of a clearly defined purpose. The second proposition that I would present to you is, the supreme aim of life should be in harmony with the nature and capabilities of the whole person. The chief end sought should be such as to bring to highest development all our powers, mental and spiritual. It should be comprehensive enough to include all right temporal ends, and of such moral excellence and attractive force as to subordinate to itself, in complete harmony, all the limitless detail of our daily choices, plans, and endeavors. It is a principle of practical ethics that every person should aim to do some one thing in this world supremely well, and in order to attain the highest efficiency, it is necessary that each should do that for which by temperament and training, they are best fitted. There is a natural division of labor indicated by natural aptitudes. One person is born with a special aptitude for trade, another for invention, another for teaching, another for mechanics, another for persuasion and argument. No person can do all things, or even many things, equally well. Efficiency inexorably demands concentration of effort. Definiteness of aim in life's work is a chief factor in successful achievement. Aimless effort is fruitless effort, 
like the action of an idiot or a madman. History and experience abound in illustrations of this truth. The failure of many a business person is clearly traceable to their lack of concentration upon some one line. The majority of people, if they would succeed, must be content to do one thing, and to do that with all their might. If you are fitted to be a mechanic, be a mechanic, and such a mechanic that those about you will find your services indispensable. If you are fitted to make shoes, make shoes, and such shoes as all the world will wish to walk in. If you are fitted to be a farmer, be a farmer, and with such deliberateness and skill that the earth will give to you as to a master the reward of her most abundant harvests. Be an artisan, be an engineer, be a merchant, be a lawyer, be a physician, be a teacher, be an artist, be a poet, be a worker, a producer of values, a true servant of your fellow citizens. And whatever you do, do that with all your energy. Only thus can you hope to attain any earthly success worth having. But remember, the main business of life is not to do, but to become. An action itself has its finest and most enduring fruit in character. All these ends in the sphere of utility are relative. They are not ultimate. No person has a right to be a mere tool, a mere wheel or spindle in the great manufactory of the world. And no person can rest with lasting satisfaction in the achievement of any material end. The person whose entire mind is concentrated on some temporal object, who seeks only success in business, or eminence at the bar, or fame in literature, will find at last that there are capabilities in their nature for which they have not provided. You may reach what you have aimed at, wealth, power, pleasure, fame, and be, after all is said and done, essentially a poor creature. No earthly and selfish pursuit can absorb the whole of a person's thought and desire without doing them irreparable harm. What is more pitiable than a rich tycoon with a little soul, or a learned professor with a starved and shriveled heart? True manhood and womanhood is of more worth than money. Character is more precious than craft or skill. Fullness of being is superior to encyclopedic learning. The graces of gentleness and pity and love are more beautiful than all the accomplishments of art. Integrity and wisdom and chivalrous temper are better than power and fame. To be a capable artisan, a successful salesman, a great financier and eloquent orator, a brilliant writer or an accomplished teacher is of much less importance than to be a true whole man, a true whole woman. Completeness in life is attained only in the line of some aim which reaches beyond earth and time to find its full scope in the eternal life of the soul. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts, please go to livinghour.org. Subscribe to our free podcast at the iTunes Store, Google Play, or Stitcher.com. To purchase our new book, Evergreen, 50 Inspirational Life Lessons, please go to inspirationallifelessons.com. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time.
Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. Coming up this weekend on our Sunday Talks, we'll be discussing the ancient philosophy of karma, as viewed by the Hindu yogis, and how it impacts your life and the immediate world around you. To learn how you can gain access to our Sunday Talks, please visit livinghour.org forward slash Sunday. Now on to today's reading which was edited and adapted from Concentration, The Road to Success by Henry Harrison Brown, published in 1907. The one and only rule I give my students is this. Never antagonize. Elaborate on this rule and it becomes never argue, never contradict. Never oppose, never resist. Resistance is pain. Antagonism creates those conditions against which you argue. Opposition but increases the evil. Contradiction breeds ill feeling. Resistance is concentration upon that which you do not want. But since concentration brings into expression that upon which thought is concentrated, any resistance brings to you that which you resist. Antagonism is weakness. Resistance is negative. You are influenced by outside suggestions. Denials, don'ts, are negative. They leave you nothing upon which to rest. Affirmations, on the other hand, are solid foundations. For this reason, say, I like. Speak not of what you do not like. Think upon what you wish, not upon what you do not wish, for your thought is creative. I would like you to think upon this until you can live in non-resistance, by ignoring all conditions of antagonism. By so concentrating your thoughts upon the things and conditions you desire, that you will recognize no excuse for contention. No one thing in all mental habits is harder to accomplish than this. Remember to always mind your own business. Any argument or antagonism is minding another person's business. All persons have an equal right as you to think and act as prompted from within. In giving them this right in your thought, you cannot resist anything they do. You will think and act your thought freely. And since goodness, truth, and love are realities and are all, when you affirm these, you will be powerful. Steal yourself with positive affirmations about life. Don't bark against the bad, but cheer the beauties of the good. When you concentrate on cheering, you cannot bark. Which shall it be? Will you be a growler or the one who cheers in the arena of life? Stop fighting and begin to love life, all of life, the good and the bad the joyful and the painful, the successes and the failures. The universe is wise. The law of cause and effect is divine. Love the law. Agree with it. Denials are antagonism. Agree with your adversary and let love have sway. I once gave a talk about non-resistance and the principle of agreement. To an adult evening class. The next week a very intelligent and positive lady said, I tried the law of non-resistance and in my case it worked. A week ago Sunday morning a newspaper boy got under my window at 5 a.m. and began to call out his papers. He annoyed me till I thought how I would shake him violently were I out there. It so affected me that I got no more sleep. Yesterday morning he began again at the same time. For a moment the old angry feeling came up. Then I thought of what I had been taught, and I said, God bless that little boy, 
he is attending to his business. How smart he is to be out so early. I hope he will sell every paper. And thinking that, I fell asleep again. I felt good all day. Let me give you another example. One of my students once told me how he had lost some money from his pocket. At first he was inclined to feel badly, but then he thought to himself, what is it your business now? It was your business to take care of your money, and you did not. Now, is it your business to feel badly and lose the lesson? Or is it your business to learn so that you may lose no more? He then decided he would not fight the inevitable, but be happy that he had learned a lesson without losing too much. See how easy it is to apply the principle of agreement? It means stop fighting, non-resistance, express faith in the all good, reconcile with life in its totality, and accept present conditions as the best for the present knowing that they are to be outgrown in love. Say to yourself, I gratefully take the good I find, the best of now and here. Beyond this, I have one more lesson to share with you today. That is, do your work, respecting the excellence of that work or lack thereof, and not whether society deems it, quote, acceptable. The profligate man or woman is not so much the one who spends years of their time or chests of money, but the one who spends them off the line of their true career, their calling. The crime which bankrupts both people and states is job work, becoming diverted from your main design to serve a turn here and there. Remember that nothing is beneath you if it is in the direction of your life. Nothing is great or desirable if it is off from that. Study yourself. Understand your own mental conditions. See where you are positive and where negative in your thought. All thoughts of any lack in yourself, all thoughts of want, all tendencies to complain, wish, or find fault with yourself, all criticism, regrets, and self-condemnation, all thoughts of inability to cope with any condition, all thoughts of shrinking, avoiding, fearing any person, thing, or condition, all thoughts of reliance upon friends, money, position, reputation, or culture, all thoughts of any assistance from without yourself. All these are thoughts of weakness. They have no drawing power. They are not attractive, produce mental conditions that are a lack of what is called personal magnetism, but which is only a lack of those character radiations that create success. Study yourself and see how much you concentrate upon such thoughts. Realize how much they influence your life, how much time you waste in thinking them over and over, how much you diffuse power by worrying, fearing, fretting, and complaining. Such thoughts are like riding the hobby horse of childhood. Ride all day and you are not an inch further on your way. This impotent method of using your thought power is but mental gum-chewing. Whenever you find within yourself thoughts of these kind, immediately change to their opposite. If you have held thoughts of failure, of want, change them at once to thoughts of possession. Never think want, never wish for anything, for you as spirit possess all in potentiality, just as the egg possesses all the songs the bird shall sing. Turn your attention to this seed within, and claim possession, and in concentration give it an opportunity for expression. 
Concentration is mental incubation. Brood over the desire as a present reality, as the mother bird broods over the egg. She knows by instinct that the chick is there, and by brooding she brings it into expression. With faith in reason and instinct, which you possess, brood over that which you know is, and which you, by affirmation, have called forth, until you see it with eye, and touch it with hand. Whenever you are inclined to say, I want, think, I have, and seek, and you shall find it within. Then let it out. Feel that you thus have, and others then will feel the same, for you will radiate those vibrations of power that cause them to feel, to believe in you, and to act under those feelings. This is what is known as charisma, and it is but the concentrated rays of the whole person turned to one purpose through concentrating upon one thought keeping in mind that thought is the directing power of all life's vibrations. As you think, so your radiations are. When you think diffusely, your radiations are diffusive, and people do not feel, do not recognize you. You make them feel by shooting your vibrations from the chamber of concentration. Then the projectile is felt. Otherwise, the powder flashes in the universal, and the projectile lies in the magazine of the soul. Feel and you make others feel. This is the law. Be a dynamo and the currents will flow. Feeling is the power which thought directs. Therefore, cultivate the power to feel. Enthusiasm is its name in conduct. Be enthusiastic. This all can be done in silence, but feel enthusiastic when you are in silence, and then power, concentrated power, will go down on the line, over the wires of your thought, to create success. As the old saying goes, mean business, and feel that business when you think. This power to feel, this feeling of power, this sense of possession, characterizes all great characters of history. We credit it to charisma or personal magnetism, but it is character. Ralph Waldo Emerson describes those of great character like this. The larger part of their power was latent, and that latent power is character a reserved force which acts directly by presence and without any means. This reserved force creates success wherever success is found. Therefore, if you will succeed, create this reserve power. It is done by concentration, by patience, by entering the silence with the consciousness of possession and there letting your whole personality be filled. It has taken me many years to come to the deep realization that there is only one law of success, and that is this. Build for yourself a perfect ideal. Think from that ideal as a present reality. Affirm that ideal as a present reality. Suggest from that ideal as a present reality. Act from that ideal as a present reality, and it becomes to you a present reality. Or we can briefly summarize it like this. Think, speak, and act just as you wish to be, and you will be that which you wish to be. Those who thus think become that which they think, because the law of life is, I am that which I think. To think is to be. Destroy my thinking power and I am destroyed. Therefore, the only thing I have to do to control my life 
is to control my thoughts and think. Control. Concentrate upon the thought of self-mastery. Self-control is the keystone of character. Faith in self is the source of personal magnetism, the source of power, the source of success. Therefore, the first thing to cultivate is faith in yourself. If you haven't read it already, read Emerson's essay, Self-Reliance, and commit to memory the passage that begins with these words. Trust thyself. Every heart beats in unison with that iron string. Also, memorize this quatrain from the poet Helen Wilman. Those who dare assert the eye may calmly wait while hurrying fate meets their demands with sure supply. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour and brought to you by the generous financial support of our patrons. Become our patron for as little as $3 a month to gain access to free transcripts and the series Our Sunday Talks, which features thought-provoking readings on spirituality and spiritual growth. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. If you are listening to our podcast in the UK, Australia, India, or anywhere else in the world, you'll be happy to know that you can now order items from our Book of Zen fashion line with free worldwide shipping. Our unique line of apparel includes t-shirts, tank tops, sweatshirts, and hoodies, all of which feature one of my very own thought-provoking sayings, To get free worldwide shipping, you need to order your items through our online store at Design by Humans. To get to this store, please go to bookofzen.com forward slash dbh. That's bookofzen.com forward slash dbh. Now on to today's reading, which was edited and adapted from The Kingship of Self-Control by William George Jordan, published in 1899. Every person has two creators, their God and themselves. Our first creator furnishes us with the raw material of our lives and the laws in conformity with which we can make that life what we will. The second creator, ourselves, has marvelous powers we rarely realize. It is what we make of ourselves that counts. When someone fails in life, they often will say, I am as God made me. But when they succeed, they proudly proclaim themselves self-made. We are placed into this world not as a finality, but as a possibility. Our greatest enemy is ourselves. In our weakness, we are a creature of circumstances. In our strength, we are the creator of circumstances. Whether you be victim or victor depends largely on you. No one is truly great merely for what they are, but ever for what they may become. Until you are truly filled with the knowledge of the majesty of your own possibility, you are merely groping through the years. To see our lives as we might make it, we must go up alone into the mountains of spiritual thought, as Jesus went alone into the garden, leaving the world to get strength to live in the world. We must there breathe the fresh, pure air of recognition of our divine importance as an individual. 
and then with mind purified and tingling with new strength, we must approach the problems of our daily lives. Humanity needs less of the I am a feeble worm of the dust idea in our theology, and more of the concept I am a great human soul with marvelous possibilities. With this broadening, stimulating view of life, we can see how we may achieve our destiny through self-control. The power of self-control is one of the great qualities that differentiates humankind from the other animals. We are the only animal capable of a moral struggle or a moral conquest. Every step in the progress of the world has been a new control. It has been escaping from the tyranny of a fact to the understanding and mastery of that fact. For ages, humanity looked in terror at the lightning flash. Today, we understand it as electricity, a force we have mastered and can control. The million phases of electrical invention are but manifestations of our control over a great force. But the greatest of all control is self-control. At each moment of our lives we are either a master or a slave. As we surrender to a wrong appetite, to any human weakness, as we fall prostrate in hopeless subjection to any condition, to any environment, to any failure, we are a slave. As we day by day crush out human weakness, control opposing elements within ourselves, and day by day recreate a new self from the failure and folly of our past, then we are a master. We are a king or queen, ruling with wisdom over ourselves. So many of us look with envy upon the possessions of others and wish they were our own. Sometimes we feel this in a vague, dreamy way, with no thought of real attainment, as when we wish we had a billionaire's wealth or a celebrity's fame. Sometimes, however, we grow bitter storm at the wrong distribution of the good things of life, and then relapse into a hopeless, fatalistic acceptance of our condition. We envy the success of others when we should emulate the process by which that success came. We shut our eyes to the thousands of instances of the world's successes, mental, moral, physical, financial, or spiritual, wherein the great final success came from a beginning far weaker and poorer than our own. Any person may attain self-control if they only will. We must not expect to gain it save by long-continued payment of a price, in small, progressive expenditures of energy. Nature is a thorough believer in the installment plan and her relations with the individual. No person is so poor that they cannot begin to pay for what they want. And every small individual payment that they make, nature stores and accumulates for them as a reserve fund in their hour of need. The patience we expend in bearing the little trials of our daily life, nature stores for us as a wondrous reserve in a crisis of life. With nature, the mental, the physical, or the moral energy we expend daily in right doing is all stored for us and transmuted into strength. Nature never accepts a cash payment in full for anything. This would be an injustice to the poor and to the weak. It is only the progressive installment plan that nature recognizes. No person can make a habit in a moment or break it in a moment. It is a matter of development, of growth, but at any moment we may begin to make, or begin to break, any habit. This view of the growth of character should be a mighty stimulus to those who sincerely desire 
and are determined to live nearer to the limit of their possibilities. Self-control may be developed in precisely the same manner as we tone up a weak muscle, by little exercises day by day. Let us each day do as mere exercises of discipline in moral gymnastics, a few acts that are disagreeable to us, the doing of which will help us in instant action in our hour of need. The exercises may be very simple dropping for a time an intensely interesting book at the most thrilling page of the story, jumping out of bed at the first moment of waking, walking somewhere when one is perfectly able to do so, but when the temptation is to take a car, talking to some disagreeable person and trying to make the conversation pleasant. These daily exercises in moral discipline will have a wondrous tonic effect on your whole mind and nature. The individual can attain self-control in great things only through self-control in little things. You must study yourself to discover what is the weak point in your armor, what is the element within you that ever keeps you from your fullest success. This is the characteristic upon which you should begin your exercise in self-control. Is it selfishness, vanity, cowardice, morbidness? temper, laziness, worry, mind-wandering, lack of purpose. Whatever form human weakness assumes in the masquerade of life, you must discover. You must then live each day as if your whole existence were telescoped down to the single day before you. With no useless regret for the past, no useless worry for the future, you should live that day as if it were your only day, the only day left for you to assert all that is best in you, the only day left for you to conquer all that is worst in you. You should master the weak element within you at each slight manifestation from moment to moment. Each moment then must be a victory for it or for you. Remember also this that the second most deadly instrument of destruction is the gun. The first is the human tongue. The gun merely kills bodies. The tongue kills reputations and oftentimes ruins characters. Each gun works alone. Each loaded tongue has a hundred accomplices. The havoc of the gun is visible at once. The full evil of the tongue lives through all the years. Even the eye of omniscience might grow tired in tracing to its finality. The crimes of the tongue are words of unkindness, of anger, of malice, of envy, of bitterness, of harsh criticism, gossip, lying, and scandal. Theft and murder are awful crimes. Yet in any single year the aggregate sorrow, pain, and suffering they cause in a nation is microscopic when compared with the sorrows that come from the crimes of the tongue. Place on one of the scale pans of justice the evils resulting from the acts of criminals, and in the other the grief and tears and suffering resulting from the crimes of the tongue and you will stare back in amazement as you see the scale you thought the heavier shoot high in the air. At the hands of thief or murderer few of us suffer, even indirectly, but from the careless tongue of friend, the cruel tongue of enemy, who is free? No human being can live a life so true so fair, so pure as to be beyond the reach of malice, or immune from the poisonous emanations of envy. The insidious attacks against one's reputation, the loathsome innuendos, slurs, half-lies, by which jealous mediocrity seeks to ruin its superiors, are like those insect parasites that kill the heart and life of a mighty oak. There are pillows wet by sobs, 
There are noble hearts broken in the silence whence comes no cry of protest. There are gentle, sensitive natures seared and warped. There are old-time friends separated and walking their lonely ways, with hope dead and memory but a pang. There are cruel misunderstandings that make all life look dark. These are but a few of the sorrows that come from the crimes of the tongue. A person may lead a life of honesty and purity, battling bravely for all they hold dearest, so firm and sure of the rightness of their life that they never think for an instant of the diabolical ingenuity that makes evil and evil gossip bloom where naught but good really exists. A few words lightly spoken by the tongue of slander, a significant expression of the eyes, a cool shrug of the shoulders with a pursing of the lips, and then friendly hands grow cold, the accustomed smile is displaced by a sneer, and one stands alone and aloof with a dazed feeling of wonder at the vague, intangible something that has caused it all. The sensational media of today is largely responsible for the craze for scandal. Each popular newspaper, website, or TV show is not one tongue, but a million tongues, telling the same foul story to as many pairs of listening ears. The vultures of sensationalism sent the carcass of immortality far off. From the uttermost parts of the earth they collect the sin disgrace and folly of humanity, and show them bare to the world. They do not even require facts, for morbid memories and fertile imaginations make even the worst of the world's happenings seem tame when compared with their monstrosities of invention. These stories and the discussions they excite develop in readers a cheap, shrewd power of distortion of the acts of all around them. To the vile tongue of gossip and slander, virtue is ever deemed but a mask, noble ideals but a pretense, generosity a bribe. The person of great success and accomplishment must expect to be the target for the envious arrows of their inferiority. It is part of the price they must pay for their advance. One of the most detestable characters in all literature is Shakespeare's Iago. Envious of the promotion of Cassio above him, he hated Othello. Iago had one of those low natures that become absorbed in sustaining their dignity, talking of preserving their honor forgetting it has so long been dead that even embalming could not preserve it. Day by day Iago dropped his poison. Day by day did subtle resentment and studied vengeance distill the poison of distrust and suspicion into more powerfully insidious doses. With a mind concentrated by the blackness of his purpose, Iago wove a network of circumstantial evidence around the pure-hearted Desdemona, and then murdered her vicariously by the hand of Othello. Iago still lives in the hearts of thousands, who have all his despicable meanness without his cleverness. The constant dropping of their lying words of malice and envy having too many instances at last worn away the noble reputations of those above them. To sustain ourselves in our own hasty judgments, we sometimes say, as we listen and accept without investigation, the words of these modern Iagos. Well, where there is so much smoke, there must be some fire. Yes, but the fire may be only the fire of malice, the incendiary firing of the reputation of another by the lighted torch of envy, thrown into the innocent facts of a life of achievement.
the Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. To read transcripts, please visit livinghour.org. Our podcast is brought to you by the kind support of listeners like you. You can become a patron for less than a cup of coffee a month. For more at livinghour.org forward slash sponsor. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. If you're ready to make a change in your life and begin on a new, healthier path toward joyful living, Our Majesty Meditation can help by rebooting your subconscious with a powerful thought platform for success. Learn more at livinghour.org forward slash majesty. Get 30% off the $11.99 purchase price by using the coupon code INSPIRATION. Now on to today's reading, which was edited and adapted from Stepping Stones to Success by Horace D. Hitchcock, published in 1916. In each of us, there should be developed a liking for some one thing that brings us the thrill of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is indeed a great tonic. You may drive yourself to do good things by sheer force of will, concentration, and so forth, but enthusiasm is a power which makes things seem easy, when in reality they are not. Enthusiasm in work is inspiration, joy and gladness. Nothing great is ever achieved without it. Enthusiasm is the root of original creation. Each one of us comes into this world a little different from any other human being. Each of us varies in mentality, and each of us is different physically and morally. Each of us lives differently. Each of us progresses or digresses in variance with others. We come then to that supreme principle. Every one of us lives in a world of our own. Every life is different. Every life is individual. Every accomplishment or success is different. Every failure is different. Your life is before you. And even with the smallest amount of imagination, you can see a little ways ahead. It is your life road. Does it turn a little ways ahead, or end in darkness? Or does it extend in a straight line ahead? Is it rough, or is it smooth in its course? Many unconsciously drift into a kind of monotonous sameness in their daily lives which in time deadens the ambition and also impairs the intellectual faculties so that any desired achievement outside of the beaten path can be accomplished only through great effort. You have the power within you to do something well and to do it like no other person. You have the power of original creation. You are in a world of your own You can, to a certain degree, develop and enlarge that power so that it will bring you more happiness, money, prestige, or whatever it is you earnestly desire to possess. Countless thousands are plodding along day by day in the same manner in dead-end jobs. Many cling on, trusting to good luck to carry them through. Every success to them is pull or just plain luck. Thousands drift on as ships on the tide, in utter oblivion to the greater prosperity and happiness that would come to them through the proper development of their own talents. What's the use, they ask, and go on blindly in the same old way? 
It is so very easy for you successful people to sit back and tell us poor devils how to succeed, is the wail of another person, implying again that luck is a synonym of success and lacking appreciation of the effort, the hard work the years of concentration that brought the rewards of success. Every man or woman who makes a success knows just why and how he or she succeeded. They have all been, without one single exception, optimists, believing life to be worthwhile, wonderful when properly lived, and aiming to get the most out of it. A pessimist has never achieved success. Enthusiasm is a stepping stone to success. I remember once the employees in a large warehouse ridiculing a certain office boy because he was constantly at work and was always doing a little more than his position called for. He was enthusiastic, cheerful, and happy in all his work. His associates laughed at him and told him he would never get a cent for all his extra trouble. But they were mistaken. Years after, he became manager and owner of the whole establishment. One of the greatest assets any young man or woman can possess is the quality of true enthusiasm and earnestness in everyday work. It will bring its rich rewards sooner or later. Today is the day that steps aside for anyone who has something worthwhile to say or do. Age or race is no barrier to accomplishment. No one need be afraid of enthusiasm. There are people who will sarcastically term enthusiasm akin to crankiness, but the half-hearted the coldly critical, the sneering, doubting, fearing set of people never accomplish anything worth the trouble of mention and serve only as stumbling blocks to those who progress onward in earnest endeavor. A piece of hot steel, even though blunt, will penetrate farther into a piece of wood than a cold, sharp piece. Burning enthusiasm will do more than a cold, calculating intelligence. Enthusiasm breeds optimism, and optimism is the forerunner of all that makes for happiness, good cheer, lightheartedness, etc. It was the optimist who said, I fell ten stories, and at each window I shouted to my friends, All right so far. It is this hopeful, optimistic type of thought that makes for the most in original creation. When the mind sets itself along these lines, it unconsciously and consciously attracts seen and unseen elements which aid in the accomplishment of a set purpose. Those who think success attract success and eventually absorb it. Environment is an important factor but the proper development of enthusiasm and the optimistic style of thinking makes for original creations in a more permanent degree. Next in the category of fundamentals necessary to original creation comes the factor of experience. The common expression that experience is the best teacher implies that it is your own experience only. Such is somewhat erroneous, as no one can begin with experience. The experience of others, coupled with your own, is the greatest of all teachers. First, learn through the experience of others. Know their causes of success, and if you know the circumstances of any failures, you will know the cause of failure. The experiences of others should furnish you with the first enthusiasm to do something likewise or something better. The experiences which are most valuable will be those which directly touch your field of endeavor. 
But even with these fortifications, you will sometimes make mistakes. Achievement is not so much a matter of not making any mistakes as it is avoiding the repetition of a mistake when it is once discovered. There are many who rely too much on their own experience and are not cognizant of the fact that the experience of others is more valuable to us before we make our own. Experience of others forms a basis of enthusiasm for original creations of our own. We are enabled through our own individual talents to sift from the experience of others the germ of an idea which we ourselves can develop and enlarge into something distinctly our own. Through specialization we concentrate on this one thing making it grow and enlarge until it meets the dimensions of our fondest desires. The good things in life are not necessarily exhausted or neglected, as is supposed by some, through the painstaking cultivation of one special faculty. However, it is true that specialization can stunt the growth of other faculties, thereby diminishing the value of the man or woman as a whole in his or her relation to society. In an intellectual way, some are inclined to underestimate the work of others who are engaged in a totally different occupation. The business person has often little regard for science, art, or philosophy, and forgets that the cultivation of these very qualities would add to their bank balance, increase their prestige, and promote their popularity. The scientist and philosopher, on the other hand, often have little tolerance for the business person and dub them a slave to lucre, devoid of anything higher. They forget that to succeed in business requires keen study, a flexible intelligence, and willpower in no small degree. To make the most of life, you cannot neglect the cultivation of those qualities of mind which go to make up a well-balanced personality. Neither must the cultivation of the body be slighted. Both, when cultivated to a reasonable degree, tend to promote your overall vitality, making it more robust and permanent. But it is right here that many make the greatest mistake of their lives. It is aptly exemplified in that hackneyed adage, they are a jack of all trades but master of none. Too many fall into the habit or the inclination to flit from one thing to another, failing to concentrate on any one thing in particular. The man or woman who wishes to have the greatest success is the one who will specialize. The world has little use for walking encyclopedias. A good storehouse of knowledge is an intellectual luxury that can be of use all through life. But what the world wants is not those who merely know, but those who make use of their knowledge and accomplish something worthwhile. Those who are producers, original creators. Specialize for producing original creations by cultivating a symmetrical personality. Make use of the knowledge that is gained, and gain no knowledge of which you cannot make use. A good knowledge of Latin will be of little value to the person whose ambition in life is to be a software developer. The qualities that are most conducive to original creation may be briefly outlined as this. 1. Enthusiasm 2. Earnestness 3. Optimism 4. Experience of others and self 5. Specialism 6. Habit formation Under habits, their use and abuse we are confronted with a factor that embraces 95% of our conscious activity. Every one of us possesses habits, 
good and bad. And it is a fact that most of our actions are the result of habit. Habit may be defined as a manner of acting and thinking, which, when repeated frequently, becomes practically automatic. It is true that most of the big things, the worthwhile things in life, are due mainly to habit. Nothing is more conducive to success than the building up of good habits. Creating or producing ideas or material things is always the result of continued habit along the line of specialism. The ability to acquire habits is indeed a wonderful human trait, because it can readily be seen that with care, patience, and practice, good habits can be formed and will be of inestimable value in the fight for success. Habit is a stepping stone to success. When an act is carefully studied, rightly practiced until it becomes a habit, it can be made into a never-failing influence. Driving an automobile is a familiar illustration of habit. The manipulation of wheel, brakes, and gas pedal is done automatically, easily and without apparent effort. It has all become a habit. But the beginner, attempting to drive an automobile for the first time and compelled to give the closest attention to each step in the process, is a typical example of an act demanding attention, in contrast to one that has developed into a habit by constant repetition. The psychology of habit formation is a deep study, and it is beyond the scope of this talk to dwell on it other than in a brief manner. Studies and experiments in physiology show us that every time we think, there is a slight change in the nerve cells in some part of the brain. The action might be likened to the disc on a phonograph. When the impression is made permanent, it is not difficult to reproduce it. In like manner, it is easy to recall or act out an old accustomed thought or act. Habit is a wonderful time saver. To save time, to increase efficiency and to prevent exhaustion, reduce acts to habits. The novice at the typewriter must first study each motion. When proficient, they can write rapidly and accurately, yet give no particular thought to the striking of each key. Habit is possible with all things requiring thought. But the formation of habits by continually practicing the things which we use in everyday life is sadly neglected. A little intelligent daily practice would convert many uninteresting and distasteful things into habit. When things are reduced to habit, they will go on automatically, and attention can be devoted to bigger things for gradual enlargement. Through such a process, one is enabled to make more use of limited time, to create more, to produce more. The more we can convert the details of our daily life into habit, the more time and energy we will have to devote to the little things that make for progress and greater success. The more our higher powers will be set free for their own proper work to create wonderful, Original Creations The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour and brought to you by the generous financial support of our patrons. Become our patron for as little as $3 a month to gain access to free transcripts and the series Our Sunday Talks which features thought-provoking readings on spirituality and spiritual growth. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. 
I'd like to start today with a little news. We have decided to expand the reach of our podcast by now uploading to YouTube. At first, we weren't sure of what kind of video to use to accompany our podcast, but many of you have told us that you often listen to our podcast in the late evening while relaxing with a glass of wine or cup of hot tea. So we thought, why not match our podcast with a burning campfire? Now you can pull up our podcast on your television, if it is connected to the internet, as a YouTube fireside chat while enjoying your drink of choice. Of course, preparing and uploading our catalog of nearly 150 podcasts to YouTube while updating with new podcasts each week will require more work. So, if you would like to support us, remember that you can do so for as little as $1 a month. To learn more about becoming a sponsor, please visit livinghour.org forward slash sponsor. That's livinghour.org forward slash sponsor. Many thanks in advance. Now on to today's reading, which has been edited and adapted from How to Develop Your Willpower by Claire Tree Major, published in 1920. The most destructive force in the world is fear. Almost all failure and almost all crime can be traced to one form or another of this most prevalent evil. Fear is the father of doubt, and doubt is the murderer of success. It shows itself in many forms, from the physical fear which is part of our animal inheritance, to the more subtle and dangerous forms which attack our mental life and sap our strength at its very foundation. Mental fear is more treacherous because it often clothes itself in fair disguises. As prudence or caution, or the normal instinct of self-preservation, it masquerades so successfully that one often deceives oneself. Prudence and caution and the instinct for self-preservation are necessary and useful if they are inspired by reason and not by fear. For fear cripples and destroys, it does not help. Fear has absolutely no place in human life and development. It is an entirely extraneous and harmful emotion. It is born of an exaggeration by the imagination of the power of other things or conditions until we believe it to be superior to our own power. It is an entirely false and misleading attitude of mind. At the moment of crisis, when our need is the greatest, it betrays us to the very danger we fear by robbing us of the very qualities of mind which we need to overcome it. Fear destroys mental balance. Under the influence of fear you cannot perceive clearly, imagine truly, reason logically, nor act usefully. The only thing in the world worth fearing is fear. If you have a problem to meet, fear will decrease or entirely destroy your power to meet it. Fear will build problems where none existed. Fear will create as much harm over something of its own imagining as if the imagined thing were real. Let's say you are sitting alone in the house after dark, thinking you hear robbers stealthily trying the windows, or creeping from door to door, or perhaps actually prowling about your rooms. You begin to suffer just as keenly, perhaps more so, than if the danger were real. There is nothing there, yet physically and nervously you have received as great a shock as if there were. This situation, repeated sufficiently often, will make you a nervous wreck, sacrificed not to danger, but to fear. Or let's say that you are an entrepreneur who is organizing a business venture. You need more money than you possess. 
you sell stock, and a board of directors is elected. The business is successful, but you begin to fear that some of the directors are looking with envious eyes on the management and will try to oust you. Your attention is distracted from the business, and your heretofore feeling of goodwill toward the others is tinged with suspicion and then with dislike. You resent the very interest which the directors are elected to show in the business. Sympathy is alienated. You lose your power, and the very catastrophe that you feared is realized. You became a sacrifice, not to your inability, for if you could succeed in the business for a time, you could do so for all time but to the fear which destroyed you. When the demon attacks you, remember to tell yourself, there is nothing to fear but fear. Fear is my greatest enemy. Do not fear yourself. Shyness, diffidence, hesitancy in meeting people or circumstances, these all stunt the growth and delay the development of the real individual. They are all the offspring of fear. How many times has an opportunity come to you to do something for which you had not the nerve? You knew in your heart you could do it, but you lacked the courage to take hold. Some other person did the thing, and you knew afterward you could have done it better. You were defeated by yourself, by your fear. Take this moment to get a grip on yourself. What other people have done, you can do. There is no power on which any other person can draw that is not also free to you. Banish the enemy fear, and you are equal of any person. Don't merely listen to these statements as sentences. Examine yourself to see if they are true. Think of the number of times where fear has destroyed you. Try to find just one instance where fear has helped you. Count the times where you suffered the tortures of the damned through fear of things which you found afterwards were mere figments of your imagination. See if fear is holding you back from something now. If you find a case against the enemy, declare war on it at once. Repeat to yourself firmly each day, I fear nothing, I am courage, I am power. You cannot be fearful and courageous at the same time. The substitution of the courage thought will destroy your fear thought. If you are shy in meeting people, substitute for the thought of yourself, which is causing the shyness, a tremendous interest in others. If you do not care what others think of you, and if your ideals in life are right, you will have no hesitancy in meeting them. If you are more interested in them and their ideas of life, more solicitous that they shall have pleasure, more keen to let them tell you something than listen to you, you will not only not have time to think about yourself and your painful embarrassment, but you will attain just the popularity which you fear that unpopularity is withholding from you. Be a good listener. You will learn more and people will love you. Do not fear people. If you feel a person is your superior in knowledge and experience, try to learn from them, but do not fear them. Keep your own ideal ahead of the greatest person you can possibly meet. Then you will feel what you gain from them is a step to help you, not only to be equal, but to pass them by. Know the power of your own will. Know always that you are on the road to the successful culmination of all your desires. Do not fear what others may do to you. No one can materially hinder you in the realization of your heart's desire if you have built up the will to aspire. Learn to joy in the battle as a chance to prove your mettle. Keep 
the power thought, and though others may force you to change your course, they cannot affect the ultimate victory. Always associate in your mind the fulfillment with the desire. What you intensely and persistently demand of life, life will give you. Fear nothing and there shall be nothing to fear. Never give up. You have never reached the limit of your own powers. Why should you be content to suppose that you are near the limit? Make it a point in life to discover your own limit. Live up to all your present power. You may find both your power and your limit to exceed anything you have ever dreamed of. Do not let yourself be blinded by a false fear. Do not fear for those you love. If your wife, your child, your friend is in danger, you will need all your mind and strength to help. You cannot afford to fail in the crisis because of the destructive influence of fear. The surgeon's hand must be steady and accurate. Fear would destroy its usefulness. The mind which loves must be steady and strong. Confusion bred by fear will kill its helpfulness. No real peril was ever averted by fear. Fear feeds on fears. Destroy the fear and maintain your own power. Fear for others is selfishness. It is not the harm to them we fear, but the unhappiness which may result to ourselves. Cultivate a keen trust in the power of others to take care of themselves. By surrounding your friends with thoughts of fear of accident and disease, you make precisely the mental atmosphere about them which will most surely leave them open to attack. By building up a mental atmosphere around them of quiet confidence in their powers, you help them to realize those powers. Be a source of confident strength to your family and friends, not a disturbing menace through fear. Do not fear the future. Live the present to the best of your ability and leave the future to take care of itself. You are building the future in every detail of your present. Perform the details of today well. There is no future, only a persisting today. All that comes you are building now. If the foundation is good, you need not begin to worry about the roof. The mere fact that you cannot yet see the roof is no menace. You did not know today till today arrived. The future is not to be feared because you do not know what it will contain. Be certain of your own strength and nothing can come in the future which you cannot meet. Never allow your imagination to picture anything in the future which you do not want. Remember that imagination is creative. It will build the good things through your thought of confident success, or it will build the bad things through your thought of apprehensive fear. It will carry out your will, your expectation. If you expect success, it will build success. If you expect failure, it will build failure. Keep your imagination free from fear. Destroy superstition. Do not fear the invisible. Do not fear for the life after death. Everything you are and can be, you are here and now. All power for which you yearn is yours, here and now. It is time to set free your will to find and be yourself. You are the God enthroned. You are yourself invisible. You are yourself life. There can be no death for you. When you discard the physical body, which shall then have become unfit for your use, you will not have changed. You will continue your life in its natural home and environment. 
there can be nothing for you to fear outside the body from whence you came to physical birth. The greater part of your present life is apart from the physical. Can it harm you to cast off this body which you have borrowed for a moment? Know yourself a part of the divine thought which created creation. Affirm always your high begetting and your high calling. Make of every circumstance an opportunity for your own growth. Nothing in this world can harm you, the real you, the real self. If nothing can harm you, there is nothing to fear. Make the following affirmations your daily dominant thought. I am myself, indestructible, invincible. I am courage, unshakable, unflinching. I am power, I cannot be defeated, I cannot fear. I am confident of success, physical, social, and business. I know nothing but good can come to me or mine. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts, please visit livinghour.org. To get 30% off our Majesty program, please go to livinghour.org forward slash majesty and use the coupon code INSPIRATION. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. A listener contacted us recently and asked how long it takes for us to produce this twice-weekly podcast. It actually takes more time than you might think. It all starts with the research and discovery of old books and texts, many of which have been relatively lost to history. The next stage involves the editing of the text into a version most appropriate for the modern podcast listener. Then we move on to the initial recording process, followed by audio editing and the finishing of the final podcasts, which you hear each week. Altogether, we spend about 15 to 20 hours a week producing and promoting the Inspirational Living Podcast. What makes that work all worthwhile for us is hearing back from you how this podcast has had a positive impact on your life. So please do share your thoughts with an iTunes review of our podcast. You can also review us at Stitcher.com or Google Play. For those who would like to help fund our podcast and the work we do, please visit our podcast website at podcast.livinghour.org. On the homepage, you'll find opportunities to make a one-time direct donation or become a sponsor for as little as $1 a month. Many thanks in advance. Any financial help you can provide is truly appreciated and will help ensure the production of this podcast for years to come. Now let's move on to today's reading, which has been edited and adapted from The Power of Mental Demand and Other Essays by Herbert Edward Law, published in 1916. Courage is the fundamental fact of success. It makes us strong in doing what we have resolved upon. Courage gives persistence, banishes weakness, displaces vacillation with steadiness of purpose, resolves doubt. It makes hesitancy and irresolution impossible. It sends us armed with confidence on our road to success. 
confidence and the expectation of success draw to us all the qualities and mental forces which contribute to success. Courage, therefore, is the vital element of success. A lack of courage creates mental difficulties. It constructs obstacles and barriers. It makes that seem impossible which, with the exercise of courage, will be entirely possible. A lack of courage creates an expectation of failure and draws to us all the mental elements that contribute to failure. It destroys our confidence in ourselves and in our purpose. It makes impossible that forceful, resolute attitude which compels success. An absence of courage in relation to accomplishment is the most vital human defect. It is a moral vacuum which draws into it all that is mean, small, contemptible, shrinking, vacillating, weakening, demoralizing, and destroying. It annihilates every noble impulse. Courage creates a resolute, influential, strong character, a determined will and a commanding force. It secures respect for our aim and confidence and interest in our purpose. Many people failing to cultivate courage wrongly ascribe their failure to acquire the things they weakly desire to causes outside of themselves. I say weakly desire because strong desire is not possible without courage. A desire which resolves itself into a command draws out the strength of all our mental forces and shapes all the physical conditions and surrounding influence favorable to achievement. Courage dares to command. There is nothing that will so overwhelm a person with disgrace and humiliation as a lack of courage. In every walk of life, it is so vital to have courage for duties, for achievements, for living, that lacking it, there is no depth of failure in which we might not descend. There is no heritage of infamy so black as the taunt of cowardice. For courage is willpower, it is determination that is unflinching. It is the power that achieves. Cowardice, on the other hand, is predetermined failure. Courage, even physical courage, is not merely the absence of fear of bodily harm or suffering. Courage is a positive quality, a continuing force. The effort which attempts and fails, and makes no second attempt, is not a display of courage but of its opposite. Courage is never conquered. It never gives up. It never admits defeat. It never apologizes. It never puts the blame of failure on something else. Courage is persistence. Courage is pluck. Courage is luck. Because with courage, success and the achievements we desire are brought into existence wrung as it were from fate or chance. Courage is the resolution to conquer. It is not a mere expression in words. Its characteristic expression is in action. It requires courage to exercise the patience that gives the mental forces rest, that arranges them and directs them steadily, thoughtfully, deliberately, Courage is the basis of intelligent action, unyielding because it makes yielding unnecessary by the direction and exercise of all the principles which it brings. Courage surrounds itself with successful forces in the same way that a resolute and skillful commander brings to bear all of their intelligence, skill, and effort for the protection and strengthening of their position. Courage implies thoroughness, forethought, deliberation, tact. 
Courage is identified with actions rather than words. Mere vague talk of success, of application, of resolution, of steadfastness is not evidence of courage. Courage is a quiet force that does not talk of itself, but which never thinks of victory as impossible. Courage brings to bear the fullest intelligence and an unyielding and unceasing effort until the aim has been achieved. The person who persists in a purpose steadfastly and resolutely and does not relinquish it until achieved exhibits a courage as high and even more arduous than the soldier who risks their life in a conflict of arms. It is a moral courage of a sustained kind, one that requires a stronger measure of personal force, oftentimes than the sudden or even heroic risk of one's life or physical safety. Courage in its highest degree is manifested in persistence and energy, with calmness and patience, exercised in the achievement of a great purpose. To be courageous means both to dare and to do. The antithesis of courage is fear, cowardice. Fear makes you doubt the likelihood of the success of your enterprise. It weakens your arm for the blow. It narrows your mental forces. It draws to you all that is weak and vacillating. It creates doubt where doubt should not exist. It leads you to apologize and explain, first to yourself and then to others, why you do not succeed. Fear drives you to reason yourself into believing that it is your love of luxury, of comfort, of friends, or something else which compels you to abandon your effort before you have achieved your end. A slave to fear, you complain of conditions you whine of fate. It is fear which prompts you to belittle others in the hope that thereby your own lack of courage will not be discovered. The harboring of fear is destructive of the power of putting forth effective effort. It paralyzes the exercise of force. It unconsciously but subtly impresses itself on every one with whom you come in contact. These thought forces, whether of fear or courage, are just as potent as words expressed. It is not always possible to analyze or even to demonstrate these thought forces of fear or courage, but they are felt and have their conscious or unconscious influence and effect on those about you, a potent influence in spite of yourself. The man or woman who says, I will go and try, but don't expect me to succeed, cultivates all the force of fear and abandons all the force of courage. Such a person prepares for failure just as absolutely as another prepares for success. It is just as impossible to be strong and courageous when you are constantly saying to yourself, I cannot do this. I must fail, it's impossible, as it is to really desire something and yet make no effort to accomplish it. Cowardice in the business arena is the only real obstacle of serious importance that successful people have to contend with. When it is once removed, when courage takes its place, every stroke adds to your strength and brings accomplishment visibly nearer. Courage saves the friction of fretting. It gives freedom from worry. It gives contentment to the mind because it promises, and its promises are valid and certain. Fear destroys the high spirit, the ambition, the commanding power that goes out from us, shaping and forming that which is worthy and stimulating and inspiring. Fear or courage is the element that determines the fate of our fortunes.
the decision as to which one it shall be rests with ourselves. Courage includes resolution and brings about the fulfillment of the things resolved upon. No slavery is so absolute as the slavery of fear. No shackles so heavy as those which fear forges. No losses are so heavy as those which fear piles up. Courage is the casting out of fear. Fear and courage are the determining influences in both individual and world progress. The courageous person unhesitatingly pushes forward where others tremble, falter, and hesitate. Fear is a negative force. Courage a positive influence. Fear robs you of every vital instinct and the power to think and to feel noble impulses. It condemns you to associate with all that is weak, poor, and undesirable. Clear, determinant thinking is of the highest value, but it is only possible to the courageous mind. Avoid regular association with people weak and uncertain in thought, for they will be incoherent in purpose and doubtful in resolve. Avoid also those who lack courage, who are hesitating, doubtful, uncertain in their action, those who fear to push out. Be resolute in following your own plans. Have the courage of your convictions. When you once start out, do not allow yourself to be changed from your course, either by the doubting argument of others or by the timorous influences of your own mind. If these fear thoughts come to you, these courage-destroying elements, throw them off. Make it a practice never to think of anything unfavorable to your undertaking. Say to yourself, I will be brave, and I will accomplish this thing. I will think of nothing else but its accomplishment. I will refuse to think of it in connection with the thought of fear or doubt of its outcome. I will call upon my mental forces for the strength of courage, for the power of persistence. I will be successful because I desire to be, because I have resolved to be, because I refuse to be unsuccessful. I know the power of my courage, and I will use it. I have confidence in that power, and I will rely upon it. Remember that you are a force and a law in yourself. The moment you allow anyone else to influence you against your own good thought, that is when you lose control of the faith in yourself which inspires courage and carries with it all those forces which courage creates. The moment you allow yourself to be swerved in your course, to begin acting on another person's thought, you desert the courage and resolution of your own mind, which alone are the forces that can sustain and carry you to achievement. Be absolutely free from fear of every kind, fear of want, fear of poverty, fear of sickness, fear of anything. Such fear saps your strength at the very outset of effort. It arises from doubt of ability in yourself, and it causes more failure and inefficiency than anything else, because it has become a fixed habit of thought in the minds of millions of men and women. Fear of all kinds must be banished from your mind. Fear has neither good nor noble results, it does not relieve your mind from strain or labor. On the contrary, it fills it with worry and fretfulness. It destroys mental forces which are of the greatest use to you. It does not stimulate you to action, but paralyzes energy. It does not surround you with those physical conditions which are favorable to success, since it makes the accumulation of wealth impossible. It does not surround you with the opportunities for extending your influence, 
since it weakens or destroys in you the very basis of influence and power. Fret and worry are the moth and rust that corrupt our strength, and fear is the thief that breaks through to steal our purpose. Whenever you find fear trying to gain an entrance, repulse it by a resolute attitude of mind and a strengthening of purpose. The power of individual accomplishment is only faintly recognized by the majority of men and women. It is only a man or woman here and there who understands their tremendous possibility. To believe you can do a thing and to have the courage to steadily, confidently, and persistently live up to that belief is to go far and achieve much. There may be difficulties and obstacles, but resolute courage will overcome them as nothing else can. Courage destroys the injurious and opposing forces by supplanting them with forces that serve us. There is thus a double gain. Courage is the basis of happiness. Courage wins honor and respect. Courage makes friends for us. Courage brings contentment. Courage is the best guarantee of good judgment. Courage instills truth. Courage brings patience. Courage meets and overcomes adversity. Courage gives life, makes failure impossible, gives self-reliance, develops influence, gives forcefulness and power to thought, implants a love for labor, is the boon companion of energy. A brave mind is impregnable to assault. To believe a business or an undertaking impossible is a sure way to make it so. Impossibilities like threatening dogs fly past those who are not afraid of them. Nothing that is of real value will you ever achieve in this life without courageous labor. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. To purchase the Majesty Program, which employs our powerful auto-suggestion sound method, please go to livinghour.org forward slash majesty. Use the coupon code INSPIRATION to receive 30% off the sales price. Subscribe to our free podcast at the iTunes Store, Stitcher.com, or Google Play. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you in part by Book of Zen, makers of wearable inspiration for a better world. Today's podcast has been edited and adapted from the essay, As a Man Thinketh, by James Allen, published in 1903. Until your thoughts are linked with purpose, there is no intelligent accomplishment in life. The majority of us simply allow our thoughts to drift aimlessly upon the ocean of life, which is why we so often unexpectedly crash against a rocky shore. Those who have no central purpose in life fall an easy prey to petty worries, fears, troubles, and self-pity, all of which are indications of weakness that lead to failure, unhappiness, and loss, for weakness cannot persist in a power-evolving universe. We should conceive of a worthy goal and set out to accomplish it. This goal may take the form of a spiritual ideal, or it may be a worldly object, according to our nature at this moment in time. 
But whatever it is, we should steadily focus our thought forces upon the goal which we have set before ourselves. You should make this purpose your supreme duty, and you should devote yourself to its attainment, not allowing your thoughts to wander away to ephemeral fancies, longings, and imaginings. This is the royal road to self-control, and true concentration of thought. Even if you fail again and again to accomplish your goal, as you necessarily must until weakness is overcome, the strength of character gained will be the measure of your true success, and this will form a new starting point for future power and triumph. Those who are not prepared for acquiring a great purpose should fix their thoughts upon the faultless performance of their duty, no matter how insignificant their task may be. Only in this way can your thoughts be gathered and focused, and resolution and energy be developed, which being done, there is nothing which may not be accomplished. The weakest soul, knowing its own weakness and believing this truth that strength can only be developed by effort and practice, will at once begin to exert itself, and adding effort to effort, patience to patience, and strength to strength, will never cease to develop, and will at last grow divinely strong. As the physically weak person can make themselves strong by careful and patient training, so the person of weak thoughts can make themselves strong by exercising right thinking. To put away aimlessness and weakness, and to begin to think with purpose, is to enter the ranks of those strong ones who only recognize failure as one of the pathways to attainment, who make all conditions serve them, and who think strongly, attempt fearlessly, and accomplish masterfully. Having conceived of your goal, you should mentally mark out a straight pathway to its achievement, looking neither to the right nor the left. Doubts and fears should be rigorously excluded, for they are disintegrating elements which break up the straight line of effort, rendering it crooked, ineffectual, and useless. Thoughts of doubt and fear never accomplished anything, and never can. They always lead to failure. Purpose, energy, power to do, and all strong thoughts cease when doubt and fear creep in. The will to do springs from the knowledge that we can do. Doubt and fear are the great enemies of knowledge, and those who encourage them, who do not slay them, thwart themselves at every step. When you have conquered doubt and fear, you have conquered failure. Your every thought is allied with power, and all difficulties are bravely met and wisely overcome. Your purposes are seasonably planted, and they bloom and bring forth fruit, which does not fall prematurely to the ground. Thought allied fearlessly to purpose becomes creative force. The individual who knows this is ready to become something higher and stronger than a mere bundle of wavering thoughts and fluctuating sensations. The individual who does this has become the conscious and intelligent commander of their mental powers. All that you achieve and all that you fail to achieve is the direct result of your own thoughts. Your weaknesses and strengths are your own. They are brought about by you and can only be altered by you, never by another. Your sufferings and your happiness are evolved from within. As you think, so you are. As you continue to think, so you remain. A strong person cannot assist the weaker one unless the weaker one is willing to be helped. And even then, the weak must become strong in themselves. They must, by their own efforts, develop the strength which they admire in another. None but themselves can alter their condition. We can only rise, conquer, and achieve by lifting up our thoughts. We can only remain weak and abject and miserable by refusing to lift up our thoughts. Before you can achieve anything, even worldly things, you must lift your thoughts above base material desires. You may not, in order to succeed, give up all desires and selfishness by any means, but a portion of it must at least be sacrificed. 
If your first thought is some selfish desire, you can neither think clearly nor plan methodically. You will not be able to find and develop your latent resources, and you will fail in any undertaking. There can be no progress, no achievement, without sacrifice. Your worldly success will correspond to the manner in which you have sacrificed your confused, ego-driven desires and fixed your mind on the development of your plans while strengthening resolution and self-reliance. The higher you lift your thoughts, the greater will be your success. The more blessed and enduring will be your achievements. The universe does not favor the greedy, the dishonest, the vicious, although on the mere surface it may sometimes appear that way. Instead, it helps the honest, the magnanimous, the virtuous. All the great teachers of the ages have declared this in varying forms. And to prove and know this truth, you have but to persist in making yourself more and more virtuous by lifting up your thoughts. Intellectual achievements are the results of thoughts dedicated to the search for knowledge or for the beautiful and true in nature and life. Such achievements may be sometimes connected with vanity and ambition, but they are not the outcome of those characteristics. They are the natural outgrowth of long and arduous effort and of pure and unselfish thoughts. Achievement of whatever kind is the royal crown of effort, the diadem of thought. Men and women ascend by the aid of self-control, resolution, and well-directed thoughts. They descend by the aid of indolence, corruption, and confused thoughts. Victories attained by right thoughts can only be maintained by watchfulness. Many give way when success is assured and rapidly fall back into failure. All achievements, whether in business, intellectual, or the spiritual world are the result of definitely directed thought and are governed by the same law and are of the same method. The only difference lies in the object of attainment. Those who would accomplish little must sacrifice little. Those who would achieve much must sacrifice much. Those who would attain highly must sacrifice greatly. The dreamers are the saviors of the world. As the visible world is sustained by the invisible, so humanity, through all its trials and tribulations, is nourished by the beautiful visions of its solitary dreamers. Society cannot forget its dreamers. It cannot let their ideals fade and die, for their dreams are the realities which we all shall one day see, know, and live by. Composer, sculptor, painter, poet, prophet, sage, and teacher, these are the makers of the afterworld, the architects of heaven. The world is beautiful because they have lived. Without them, laboring humanity would perish. All those who cherish a beautiful vision, a lofty ideal in their heart, will one day realize it. Beethoven heard symphonies in his mind and then created them. Copernicus sensed the existence of a multiplicity of worlds in a wider universe, and then he revealed it. Buddha beheld the vision of a spiritual world of stainless beauty and perfect peace, and then he entered into it. Cherish your visions, cherish your ideals, cherish the music that stirs in your heart, the beauty that forms in your mind, the loveliness that drapes your purest thoughts. For out of them will grow all delightful conditions, all heavenly environments. Of these, if you but remain true to them, your world will at last be built. To desire is to obtain. To aspire is to achieve. Dream lofty dreams, and as you dream, so shall you become. Your vision is the promise of what you shall one day be. Your ideal is the prophecy of what you shall at last unveil. The greatest achievement was at first and for a time a dream. The oak sleeps in the acorn, the bird waits in the egg, and in the highest vision of the soul a waking angel stirs. Dreams are the seedlings of realities. 
Your circumstances may be difficult, but they shall not long remain so if you but perceive an ideal and strive to reach it. You cannot travel within and stand still without. You will realize your vision, not the idle wish, of your heart, be it base or beautiful, or a mixture of both, for you will always gravitate toward that which you secretly most love. Into your hands will be placed the exact results of your own thoughts. You will receive that which you earn, no more, no less. Whatever your present environment may be, you will fall, remain, or rise with your thoughts, your vision, your ideal. You will become as small as your controlling desire, as great as your dominant aspiration. The thoughtless, the ignorant, and the indolent, seeing only the apparent effects of things and not the things themselves, talk of luck, of fortune, of chance. They do not see the trials and failures and struggles which the successful have voluntarily encountered in order to gain their experience, have no knowledge of the sacrifices they have made of the undaunted efforts they have put forth, of the faith they have exercised, that they might overcome the apparently insurmountable and realize the vision of their heart. They do not know the darkness and the heartaches. They only see the light and joy and call it luck. They do not see the long and arduous journey, but only behold the desired goal and call it good fortune. They do not understand the process but only perceive the result and call it chance. In all human affairs there are efforts and there are results, and the strength of the effort is the measure of the result. There is no such thing as chance. Gifts, powers, material, intellectual, and spiritual possessions are the fruits of effort. They are thoughts completed, goals accomplished, visions realized. The vision that you cherish in your mind, the ideal that you enthrone in your heart, this you will build your life by, this you will become. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts of our podcasts, visit us online at livinghour.org. Today's podcast was sponsored in part by autosuggestion.io. Transform your life in 30 days. Discover the autosuggestion sound method at autosuggestion.io. And by Book of Zen, makers of wearable inspiration and motivational gifts. Visit them online at bookofzen.com. Subscribe to the Inspirational Living Podcast by looking us up in the iTunes Store. If you're using an Android phone, download the Stitcher app and you'll find us on there. We deliver new podcasts twice a week, every Tuesday and Thursday. Thanks for joining us. I look forward to talking to you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. Purchase our popular motivational books today at the website inspirationallifelessons.com. Available now both in heirloom hardcover and ebook. Today's reading was edited and adapted from Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, published in 1937. Power is essential for success in the accumulation of wealth, in any form. Plans are inert and useless, without sufficient power to translate them into action. Today I will describe the method by which any individual may attain and apply power. Power may be defined as organized and intelligently directed knowledge. Power, as the term is here used, refers to organized effort, 
sufficient to enable an individual to transmute desire into wealth, whatever that may be. Organized effort is produced through the coordinated effort of two or more people who work together toward a definite end in a spirit of harmony. Power is required for the accumulation of wealth. Power is necessary for the retention of wealth after it has been accumulated. Let us now identify how power may be acquired. If power is, as I've stated, organized knowledge, let us examine the sources of knowledge. Number one, infinite intelligence. This universal source of knowledge may be acquired through the aid of creative imagination and the subconscious. Number two, accumulated experience. The accumulated experience of humanity or that portion of it which has been organized and recorded, may be found in any well-equipped public library, and today, the Internet. An important part of this accumulated experience is, of course, taught in our public schools and colleges, where it has been classified and organized. Number 3. Experiment and Research in the field of science, and in practically every other walk of life, scientists and professionals are gathering, classifying, and organizing new facts daily. This is the source to which one must turn when knowledge is not available through accumulated experience. Here, too, the creative imagination must often be used. Knowledge may be acquired from any of these sources, and it may be converted into power by organizing it into definite plans, and by expressing those plans in terms of action. Examination of the three major sources of knowledge will readily disclose the difficulty anyone will have, if they depended upon their efforts alone, in assembling knowledge and expressing it through definite plans in terms of action. If our plans are comprehensive, and if we contemplate large goals, we must generally induce others to cooperate with us before we can inject into them the necessary element of power. This thus leads to the idea of gaining power through what is called the master mind, the master mind may be defined as coordination of knowledge and effort in a spirit of harmony between two or more people for the attainment of a definite purpose. No individual may have great power without availing themselves of the master mind. If you cultivate a desire to achieve something great, and have laid out a well-defined plan to pursue with persistence and intelligence, and with the help of a master mind group, your objective will have been halfway reached even before you begin to recognize it. In order that you might better understand the intangible potentialities of the power available to you through a properly chosen master mind group, I will explain the two characteristics of the mastermind principle, one which is economic in nature and the other psychic. The economic feature is obvious. Economic advantages may be created by anyone who surrounds themselves with the advice, counsel, and personal cooperation of a group of people who are willing to lend you wholehearted aid in a spirit of perfect harmony. This form of cooperative alliance has been the basis of nearly every great fortune. Your understanding of this great truth may definitely determine your financial status. The psychic phase of the mastermind principle is much more abstract, much more difficult to comprehend because it relates to the spiritual forces with which the human race as a whole is not well acquainted. 
you may catch a significant suggestion from the following statement. No two minds ever come together without thereby creating a third, invisible, intangible force which may be likened to a third mind. Keep in mind the fact that there are only two known elements in the whole universe, energy and matter. It is a well-known fact that matter may be broken down into units of molecules, atoms, and electrons. These are units of matter which may be isolated, separated, and analyzed. Likewise, there are units of energy. The human mind is a form of energy, a part of it being spiritual in nature. When the minds of two people are coordinated in a spirit of harmony, the spiritual units of energy of each mind form an affinity, which constitutes the psychic phase of the master mind. The master mind principle, or rather the economic feature of it, was first called to my attention by Andrew Carnegie. Mr. Carnegie's mastermind group consisted of a staff of approximately 50 people with whom he surrounded himself for the definite purpose of manufacturing and marketing steel. He attributed his entire fortune to the power he accumulated through this mastermind. Analyze the record of any person who has accumulated a great fortune and many of those who have accumulated modest fortunes, and you will find that they have either consciously or unconsciously employed the master mind principle. Great power can be accumulated through no other principle. Energy is nature's universal set of building blocks, out of which she constructs every material thing in the universe, including humankind in every form of animal and vegetable life. Through a process which only nature completely understands, she translates energy into matter, and nature's building blocks are available to us in the energy involved in thinking. Our brain may be compared to an electric battery. It absorbs energy from the ether which permeates every atom of matter and fills the entire universe. It is a well-known fact that a group of electric batteries will provide more energy than a single battery. It is also a well-known fact that an individual battery will provide energy in proportion to the number and capacity of the cells it contains. The brain functions in a similar fashion. This accounts for the fact that some brains are more efficient than others, and leads to this following proposition. A group of brains coordinated or connected in a spirit of harmony will provide more thought energy than a single brain, just as a group of electric batteries will provide more energy than a single battery. Through this metaphor, it becomes immediately obvious that the mastermind principle holds the secret of the power wielded by people who surround themselves with other men and women of brains and intelligence. There follows now another proposition which will lead still nearer to an understanding of the psychic phase of the mastermind principle. When a group of individual brains are coordinated and function in harmony, the increased energy created through that alliance becomes available to every individual brain in the group. It is a well-known fact that Henry Ford began his business career under the handicap of poverty, illiteracy, and ignorance. It is an equally well-known fact that within the inconceivably short period of ten years, Mr. Ford mastered these three handicaps and that within 25 years he made himself one of the richest men in America. Connect with this fact the additional knowledge that Mr. Ford's most rapid strides became noticeable from the time he became a personal friend of Thomas Edison, 
and you will begin to understand what the influence of one mind upon another can accomplish. Go a step further and consider the fact that Mr. Ford's most outstanding achievements began from the time that he formed the acquaintances of Harvey Firestone, John Burroughs, and Luther Burbank, each an individual of great intelligence, and you will have further evidence that power may be produced through a friendly alliance of minds. There is little, if any, doubt that Henry Ford was one of the best informed men in the business and industrial world. The question of his wealth needs no discussion. Analyze Mr. Ford's intimate personal friends, some of whom have already been mentioned, and you will be prepared to understand the following statement. People take on the nature and the habits and the power of thought of those with whom they associate in a spirit of sympathy and harmony. Henry Ford whipped poverty, illiteracy, and ignorance by allying himself with great minds whose vibrations of thought he absorbed into his own mind through his association with Edison, Burbank, Burroughs, and Firestone, Mr. Ford added to his own brain power the sum and substance of the intelligence, experience, knowledge, and spiritual forces of these four men. Moreover, he appropriated and made use of the mastermind principle, a principle that is available to you. Let us turn our attention now to Mahatma Gandhi. In the beginning of Gandhi's protest against Britain, the majority of people looked upon him as merely an eccentric little man who went around without formal wearing apparel, making trouble for the British government. In reality, though, Gandhi was not an eccentric and grew into one of the most powerful men of his time. His power was passive, but it was real. Let us study the method by which Gandhi attained his stupendous power. It may be explained in a few words. He came by power by inducing over 200 million people to coordinate with mind and body in a spirit of harmony for a definite purpose. In brief, Gandhi accomplished a miracle for it is a miracle when 200 million people can be induced, not forced, to cooperate in a spirit of harmony for a limitless time. If you doubt that this is a miracle, try to induce any two people to cooperate in a spirit of harmony for any length of time. Every person who manages a business knows what a difficult matter it is to get employees to work together in a spirit even remotely resembling harmony. The list of the chief sources from which power may be attained is, as I've already said, headed by infinite intelligence. When two or more people coordinate in a spirit of harmony and work toward a definite objective, they place themselves in position through that alliance to absorb power directly from the great universal storehouse of infinite intelligence. This is the greatest of all sources of power. It is the source to which the genius turns. It is the source to which every great leader turns, whether they are conscious of the fact or not. The other two major sources from which the knowledge necessary for the accumulation of power may be obtained, experience and experiment, are no more reliable than our five senses, and the senses are not always reliable. However, infinite intelligence never errs. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. Transform your life in 30 days with our Majesty Meditation Program. Get 30% off the $11.99 purchase price with the coupon code INSPIRATION. 
Learn more at livinghour.org forward slash majesty. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time.